Have a seat. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you so much. My beautiful wife, I got to worship. Thank you for the beautiful worship team. Can we give it up for the worship team this morning? And the reason why I'm talking about my wife is she's the beautiful redhead right behind me. This is our first official Sunday here at Grace Point West. Man, you have made us feel so loved. And let me just tell you something, man. You guys are a sight for sore eyes. There's no doubt about that. And as you, over time, begin to hear my story in the process of actually kind of what's led me to the stage, you will understand just what a what it, how much it comes from the depth of my heart when I say you are a sight for sore eyes, man. Um, if you don't know who I am, I am I do have the honor of saying that I'm now your lead pastor. And when I say it's an honor, yeah, God is so good. I'm sorry he didn't give you one with hair, but this is what you got. All right, we're just going to have to roll with it, okay? But this time, I just kind of want to set up a little bit of history. This time last year, it was August of last year, I was during a worship session, just like you guys are. I was in the middle of the congregation somewhere in Colorado Springs at our church, and I was worshiping. And as I was worshiping, I just felt like God was saying, David, in this next season, I'm going to call you to be a lead pastor or a senior pastor, one of the two. It's interchangeable. And so I just encourage you, when you hear these whispers that seem almost elementary in some ways, where like you go... You hear the voice of the Lord say, I can be trusted. And you go, but it feels different that time you hear it. I encourage you to steward those things. So what I started doing is putting these little moments in my phone where I felt like that was a breath of fresh air. Maybe that was the Lord actually saying that as opposed to some sort of just a knowledge-based understanding of God. And so as I began to, began to do that, I, he began to start giving me more specific things. And that was one of them. This was a year ago. And so my wife and I just want you to know, since August and our daughter, August of last year, we began to pray. We're like, Lord, if this is really true, then show us the way. Now, we thought it'd come pretty quick, maybe September, October, 60 days tops. No. Fasting and prayer and prayer and fasting, seeking the Lord. If this is true, only you can make it come to pass. Little did we know that he would bring us to a place that we call home, to a group of people we call family. And it is not lost on us. We truly love you guys. And I fell in love with you before I even met you. In March of this last year, once, once again, I'm in the congregation, I'm worshiping, we're in Colorado Springs. And the Lord just gave me this picture of this congregation of about 800 folks. And I, I didn't know where it was going to be. I actually thought it was going to be Southern California, if you want to know the God's honest truth. But uh, I, so there, there was a beach involved in this vision, but <laughs> there's three hours away. We'll take what we can get. But I just had this picture, and in this moment, I was so moved at how much God loves that congregation that I, I saw in my mind. I began to weep because I felt his love, and then I saw this congregation in the, his left hand. And I just want you to understand something, guys. I've been praying for that congregation ever since and dearly love that congregation because God loves that congregation and that congregation turns out to be you. So I want you to understand something. We're not here because this is an opportunity. This is a mandate from the Lord because he's going to do a new thing. And we're excited. And we don't know what it is. But we're going to let him color with the paints that he wants to color with. But I want to join in with you, man. And he loves you. And he has seen your sacrifice. He has seen your steadfastness. It's going to be freaking sweet if you want to know the truth, Okay. So you're ready to step into a new season, Grace Point. Well, then let's get after it, man. Um, I'm going to pray one more time. So, Father, you know everything I said was true. That's exactly what happened, Lord. And so I want to thank you so much, God, that now you've allowed this to come to fruition. Man, Lord, bless this congregation. Open their eyes to see what you see. Help them to see themselves as you see them, Lord. And, Father, I'm going to thank you right now. For those who don't even know what Grace Point West is, who are going to be coming through these doors and they're going to discover what uncommon life in Christ is. Father, prepare us, prepare our hearts, and may we say yes to what you want to do in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So I, got, I really want to honor my time this morning, so you better listen fast because I'm going to be talking fast this morning because we have child care workers who are in the back teaching our children about Jesus, and I want to honor them and not go late. So let's get after it. We're starting a new series called Jesus Period. Jesus Period, man. That's it. Um, 
here's how the season, the series came about. Um, I was in South Carolina. I was speaking at an event for six days there, and then I came back. I flew back Monday night, uh, jumped into moving on Tuesday, loaded up our truck on Tuesday, left on Wednesday, arrived here on Thursday, and then, you know, we're off to the races. So it's just been a blur. And so the only time I had to actually think about what I was going to preach on was the two days I was sitting in my rider truck making my way down to Texas, and my guinea, my daughter's guinea pig was my co-pilot, and we were just driving down to Texas. And I'm like, Lord, what is it you want me to preach on? Because I never, I don't want to, I, I, listen, guys, I don't preach like what I want to preach. You'll, you don't need to hear from me. You need to hear from the Lord. My job is just to be his spokesperson. And so I take that very seriously. And so I prayed. And I was like, Lord, what do you want me to preach on? And, he, you know, over, the, over this process, he's taken to me this passage in, in John where Jesus says this. And I'm going somewhere to hang tight. But this is what Jesus says. He says, yes, I am the vine. You are the branches, Grace Point West. Those who remain in me, I in them. They will produce much fruit. For apart from me, Jesus says, you can do nothing. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples, and this brings great glory to my Father. I love how Jesus is saying to each and every one of us, look, I know you don't have what it takes. Congratulations, blessed are those who are humble enough to realize they don't have what it takes. Because it's in this moment God is able to show up in our weakness, in our unqualifications, all the things that we feel that would put us out of the game. He's like, no, if you remain in me, the fruit that I produce is going to be done through me. Abide. Everybody say abide. Man, we make it so hard, don't we? So I want to be a church, and I want to be a pastor, and I want to be with people that produce much fruit, beautiful fruit. And so here's what I can tell you as the Lord is developing his vision in my heart for this congregation and for this city. As long as I'm your pastor, this is one thing I can tell you right now. Grace Point West is and will be all about Jesus, period. Nothing else. And when I say that, Literally, like every aim, every initiative, every strategy, every program, every dollar that we give, every time we open the doors, it is going to be about leading common people into uncommon life in Christ. That's what we're about. And that's why, I mean, that's where the life is at. I mean, here's the reality of it. Here's why this is so important to me. Because what we see in Scripture is those who want to do church... And programs without Jesus, they just want him to bless their efforts without versus allowing them to be abiding within him. What will happen is we will have a church that has a form of godliness, but we will deny the power. Guys, I'm a recovering pastor's kid. I have grown up in church. I have done it all. I know what church face looks like. I know what it feels like. I'm not interested in being a part of a church that comes in here where we have to fake it. There's a reason why the world calls us hypocrites, and it's because we are. Many times we feel this this need to come in here and impress one another with our spiritual talk. No, man, let this be a place where we can be real, real family, real Christians. Sanctification process, progress, not perfection. So guess what? You don't have to bring your church mask anymore. You can just come in as you are and let Jesus deal with you, okay? But I believe that God is positioning us not to only just witness a move of God. I sincerely believe he is going to invite us in to the move that he's about to make. So we don't have to just be observers. No, no, no. He's inviting us into it. But if we want a move of God, we have to allow God to move. And that many times creates disequilibrium and it causes us to feel a little bit uncomfortable and it pushes us out of our comfort zones. But I don't want to sing songs that I've never experienced myself. I don't want to preach sermons about a move of God that I never see with my own eyes. Jesus is going to rock this place. And we get to be a part of this, guys. And so I said, Lord, what do you want me to preach on my very first Sunday? It would have been a lot more convenient if he gave me a sermon I've already written. He said, David, talk about foundations. So guess what we're going to be talking about this morning? Foundations. As I did research um, throughout the course of this last week behind, you know, between like trying to figure out where my socks are, you know, because we're still unpacking boxes, um, my toothbrush. But as I did some research, I read in the scriptures, you're going to see this word foundation used a lot. And many times it's used in terms of establishing something 
for the kingdom in Scripture, Old and New Testament. But when I think about a foundation, if you think about a foundation for a house, for example, how many of y'all have had a home built before? Let me just see a show of hands. You've had a home, and you've been a part of that process. When they pour that foundation, doesn't it look like the house is going to be about 10 feet big? It's just so, it's, it's, it's weird. It's like an optical illusion. You can't sense, you're like, I think the kitchen's going to go here, and you can't figure stuff out. There's nothing really excited about the foundation. You don't pull up to a house at Parade of Homes and go, whoa, the foundation is mind-blowing. No, foundations, we don't do that. But any builder will tell you that if you don't have a strong foundation, it doesn't matter how pretty that house is, it's going to fall. It's not going to stand the time that, that a good foundation can provide for a structure. And so my wife and I, we're experts in this because the times that we're able to pry our remote control out of our 10-year-old daughter's hands... We will, instead of going to cable news, because I don't have the tolerance to be able to take any of it uh, at this point. The people yelling and arguing all day can't hang. I need peace in my house. So we watch HGTV, okay? <laughs> that is like the Switzerland of channels, is it not? It's like so neutral, they just say, we're going to build homes and make them pretty, right? I don't know what is so satisfying about watching strangers buy kitchen cabinets and paint, pick paint colors, but it sparks joy within us. And before you start judging me, I mean, how can you not watch Chip and Joanna and feel good afterward, right? Come on, come on. Our, our Waco neighbors. But over time, my wife and I have kind of picked, because we've logged some hours. I know we should have been praying and reading the Bible. Don't judge me. But here's the thing. We've kind of noticed a trend. And the trend is this. On all these shows, it doesn't matter which one it is. They will come and they'll buy. The, maybe you've seen this yourself. Well, someone will go, okay, well, yeah, we, we need to remodel the kitchen. We need to move this wall. We need to put a new roof or, you know, fix this little hole in the thing or whatever. But then what happens? One of the property brothers, one of those twins, I can never tell who's who, they come and they say, um, I hate to break it to you, but uh, you're having foundational issues. And that is the budget killer, right? And so like 98% of the budget goes to fixing the thing, and they just get to like buy one lamp from Ikea, and that's the remodel. But it's a big deal because these guys, anybody in this, these shows know that if you have foundational issues, it doesn't matter how much granite you shove in a kitchen, that house is not going to be worth living in. It reminded me of the story, my friend Glenn, he's a pastor at New Life Church up in Colorado Springs, and he was talking about this house, older home, it's about a 100-year-old home that was remodeled, and um, over time, they noticed after the remodel that they started to see a, a crack in the ceiling begin to form in the dining room, and they thought, man, you know, maybe the house is just settling a little bit, maybe it's a roof issue, so the crack continued to get bigger and bigger, and what happened was they're having friends over for dinner in the dining room, and they're sitting there. And that, out of nowhere, the chandelier detached from the ceiling and crashed right down in the middle of the dining room table. There was like rotisserie chicken and glass everywhere, okay? Kind of a nightmare. They, they were like, well, what's wrong with the ceiling? There must be a leak. No, there was no problem with the covering. What the issue was actually with the foundation. It affected the covering. The foundation is critical. And there's this guy named Paul who is writing this letter in 1 Corinthians, who is writing this letter to a church in the city of Corinth. Now, I'm not going to get into a bunch of details because we don't have time, but he has a list of really major concerns that he's writing out to this, this church, these folks in Corinth, and they're, they're trying to lead a church, and it started strong. But one of the major concerns was this particular church's foundation. He had a real concern about that, and, and in some ways, the city of Corinth actually reminds me of San Antonio, and what I mean by that is Corinth had this wide mix of different cultures and, and belief systems, and it was kind of like this melting pot like San Antonio is, but not only that, the city was also blessed, like big time blessed economically, intellectually, and geographically, and so it was kind of preserved and kind of was able to withstand downturns in economies and other places. They were strong and robust. But the moral and spiritual fabric of Corinth, the city, is beginning to fade and deteriorate. And so now there's issues within Corinth where they're prospering, but at the same time, their moral and spiritual compass is getting mixed up. And what is happening is the culture is now beginning to kind of shape what the church in Corinth is beginning to look like. Okay? So these things are starting to come in, and over time, the focus and the foundation of this church Turn from prioritizing Jesus to prioritizing preferences. 
And so what happens is the culture is defining the foundation of this church now. It's no longer being defined by Jesus. And beyond that, there's infighting, there's jealousy, people are getting into drama, they're vying for position and power, and there's this division that's taking place. Got people arguing over which leader they like the best. They're like, oh, no, I love Paul. Well, I love Apollos, right? I love Pastor Billy Bob. Well, I love Pastor Skeeter, right? And so people are forming these allegiance. That's not in Scripture. Maybe in the message version, I don't know. But and I'm just kidding. I love Eugene Peterson, God rest his soul. But here's the thing. There, there's these factions, and they're like, well, I follow this person. I follow this person. So this is going on. But because of their spiritual immaturity, and I want you to catch this, it created self-righteousness. So people were overly impressed with how spiritual they were, and yet they couldn't even eat the meat of God's word. They were so immature. They couldn't see beyond what they thought was so special about themselves. They were really impressed with their spiritual maturity when, in fact, it made them very immature. They were self-righteous. In addition to that, there was blatant allowance of sin to be under the roof, uncontested and allowed within the body of Christ. Spiritually speaking, they're no longer being built on Jesus, but opinions and personalities and preferences. And none of us are exempt. So Paul writes this letter, and this is what he says in a very strong but loving way. He says, guys, what are you doing? What's wrong with you? You've lost your direction. He's like, because of God's grace to me in 1 Corinthians 3.10, he says, I've laid the foundation like an expert builder. If we can put that scripture up, that would be great. Now others are building on it. He says, but whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful. It is a sacred call, and it's a very sacred thing to build a church on the foundation of Jesus. And you can't be haphazard about it, and you can't start putting in things that you would like to see. It's Jesus who is the builder. It's Jesus who is the foundation. It is Jesus who is the covering. And the problem is, is that at this point, and it happens to the best of us, they've lost their way. And so Paul clarifies something. He's like, listen, you better be super careful about what you're building on this foundation because it's easy to build a church that looks more like you than it looks like Jesus. It's very easy to do. And so just because you think your church looks good doesn't necessarily mean it looks like God. And so we have to consider this ourselves. And Paul says, let me remind you what the church's foundation is supposed to be. Verse 11, please put that up. It says, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. And I share that with you because as I've sought the Lord for what reflects his heart for Grace Point West in this new season, please hear me. I don't feel like he's reprimanding any of us in here. I know it's strong this morning, serious, but I don't feel like he's reprimanding us as much as he is reminding us, okay? And it's this. The truth is, Jesus alone is and will be Grace Point West's foundation. And now that Paul has reminded them that Jesus alone and is reminding us that Jesus is the foundation of this, of this experience called church, he says, anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But on Judgment Day, fire is actually going to reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire is going to show if a person's work has any value. And so we have an opportunity here to consider how, what are we adding to the structure? What are we actually building on the foundation of Jesus here at Grace Point West? Because if it's anything other than the kingdom materials, which are these precious materials that are able to withstand the flames, all of our hard work, if it's done with the wrong materials, it's going to burn. In other words, we've wasted our time having the form of godliness, building towards our preferences instead of kingdom things. There's a difference. And Paul is saying there's two groups of materials that you can use. And so as I began to pray, and yesterday I was just working through this, I was like, Lord, what are the materials like that we should be using for Grace Point West that I want, I mean, it's one thing to say, you know, use these things, we go, mm, but we don't know what it means. And this is the list that the Lord gave me, and it's not an exhaustive list, but these are the things that he put on my heart. And I think if we started here, we could really do some damage for the kingdom, and it's this. If Jesus is Grace Point's foundation, we will build our church with the following things, prayer, Real prayer, not God is good, God is great, bless our food, bless my plate, amen, whatever. No, real prayer, intercession, 
worship, giving God what he's due, right? Fasting. And you're like, okay, Dave. Cracker Barrel is like an hour from now. Don't talk about, no, no, no. I understand. We'll, we'll, t- we'll preach about that a couple Sundays from now. Don't you skip out on it either. Skip, skip a meal of anything, right? Serving God's promises. We build on God's promises, the truth of God's word, humility. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about Jesus, right? Faith is what opens the doors. Faith is what move, moves mountains. Faith is what gives birth to the vision that God has placed in our hearts. Hope and love, led, inspired, and breathed and directed by the power of his Holy Spirit. Dude, if we do this, watch out. And in so many ways, the Lord was like, look, this is really what's already in place for Grace Point. It's grace, gifts, give, grow, go, and grow. Those are the G5. If you don't know about that, you're going to hear a lot about it in the coming days. But imagine with me, just imagine with me what it would look like if we were a church about these things. What could God do? Last week as I drove to the city limits of San Antonio, and I'm making my way in, and I'm a son of San Antonio. I I moved here originally in 1973. Yes, I am that old. Um, But in 1973, I was three years old and uh, moved here. And I've lived here most of my life except four years in Colorado and two years or close to three years in Nashville long enough to find a wife. The rest of the time I've been here in South Texas. And so I love this city, and it has a lot of memories. And I've done a lot of bad things in this town, but I've done some decent stuff too. But as I drove to the city limits of San Antonio, if you could put that picture up, what I did is I parked my moving truck, and I I didn't want to go another inch. And I parked my moving truck, and I got on the side of (laughs) I-10. Your nutty pastor is on the side of I-10 on the access road. Okay, I'm not an idiot, but I am crazy. I'm on the access road, and I didn't even care, but I got on both my knees, and I prayed right next to the sign, and I prayed for our city, and I prayed that our city would understand and feel and experience the love and the salvation and the revelation of Jesus' love and presence. I prayed over our city. For every man, woman, boy, and girl in this town, regardless of what their affiliations are, their skin color, their socioeconomic, their educational background, the, the whatever thing that the enemy uses to divide neighbor against neighbor, those have got to be the days of the past, guys. And I prayed that way and will continue to do so because I believe God loves the whole city of San Antonio. And simply, I want us to be a church that simply loves what God loves. And so if he loves all of San Antonio, guess what we get to do? We're invited in to love San Antonio as well. It's not our job to pre-qualify people. Our job is to say, come, experience what it means to have uncommon life in Jesus. And so my feeling is if God loves San Antonio and Jesus is our foundation and we build this house with what God has given us through his mandates of scripture, I think that as we build this structure, the way that I saw it as I was finishing up the sermon last night is a beautiful, big, inviting front door that says Isaiah 61 and it's inscribed on it. That's the picture I had. And you go, well, what's Isaiah 61? Well, actually, it was a prophecy Hundreds of years before Jesus showed up on the earth to fulfill what God sent him here to do. This is a prophecy of what Jesus has done. And I would love to see it, spiritually speaking, inscribed on this massive front door for San Antonio to come through. And what is it? What would we want them to walk through and experience? This is what uncommon life looks like. It starts out as common people. But Jesus shows up and the spirit, it says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. For the Lord has anointed Jesus, the Messiah, to bring good news to the who? The poor. He has sent Jesus to comfort the brokenhearted, to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He has sent Jesus to tell those that who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come and with it the day of God's anger against their enemies. To all who mourn in Israel, to all who mourn in San Antonio, to all who mourn at Grace Point West, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness they will be like great oaks that that the Lord has planted for his own glory. 
This is alive, and this is what God is wanting to do with the body of believers that are willing to take this prophecy seriously. Jesus says, I leave, but I now give you the keys, and you will actually go and do greater things that I have done. The Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, do you not understand the great exchange? We've got that spirit within us. And if that's the case, we have the power of God in us to continue the mission that Jesus started thousands of years ago that we're now entrusted with. Notice what happens, though, when we set the stage for Jesus to do this. And this door is open and it's inviting to people. Once they've been fed, once they've been rescued, once they've been restored by Jesus, it says they will rebuild the ancient ruins, repairing cities destroyed long ago. And they will revive them, though they have been deserted for many generations. Do you see the response of what takes place? When someone is rescued by Jesus, their next step is to respond to the brokenness in their cities physically and spiritually. So this isn't just about us. What the decision we make and the foundation that we build on and the resources that we use will affect generations for years and years to come. Way after we're gone, we have left our mark for the kingdom if we take this seriously. So what I would tell you is our house is gonna be built on the foundation of Jesus with a big inviting door that is open to everyone in San Antonio. Now, If that idea bothers some of you, and I understand, because I understand you're already beginning to filter in through your own perspective and maybe your own leanings, I understand that. Please hear what I'm saying. It is not our job to sort out who's worthy of the gospel. Our job is to open the door and say, come in. Come in. See for yourself. Taste and see that the Lord is good. So we're going to have to set our own preferences aside. We can't be divisive. We need to allow these people to come in. And so if you don't agree with this, though, you simply don't agree with Jesus' purpose for coming to the earth to begin with. My heart for this church is to see anyone who comes to this big, huge, inviting door, the cynics, the saints, the prodigals, the confused, the captive, the addicted, the lost, can experience and discover uncommon life in Jesus. If we don't have a big door to allow people to come in and experience the love of Jesus through our smile, through our serving, what we do in these kingdom materials that God has entrusted us with, you have to understand it's written on our wall back there, and it's just words on a wall if we don't have a door for them to walk through and get it. Not only that, we're also called to take it out, but that's another day. If you draw an eight-mile circle around our church, Did you know that there's a quarter of a million residents eight miles from this church? Eight miles from this church. 93% of them do not claim a church affiliation. Guys, while going global is awesome, do you understand the harvest is white and ready to be reached for the gospel for a stone's throw from this stage? God has set us up and positioned us in such a way that I think we would freak out if we could see the fulfillment of what he wants to do in this next season. And it's not just about growth. It's about depth. It's about seeing dead things come to life. And so even if we don't grow one person, that's not my goal. My ego doesn't need a big church. I've already been at a big church. I just left a church of 10,000 folks. I know what mega churches look like, and they're fine. But I want to see God do what he wants to do. As the band comes up, I've been talking about us, and I felt like this is where the Lord wanted us to go. Cast vision, let you know, man, I take this stuff super serious. And it's going to be fun. It's not going to be work. It's going to be fun. It's going to be life-giving because God is life-giving. But I've been talking about us, but for a second, I want to talk about you personally. And my question for all of us in here, whether it be in your life spiritually, your marriage, your family, your career, your next steps, whatever those things are, my question is you to you is what are you building your foundation? What, what are you building? What's the foundation you're building your life on? Paul says, everyone who hears, I'm sorry, Paul says, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. That's not just a church thing. That's a Jesus thing for us personally. Jesus said about foundations, he says, everyone who hears my teaching and applies it to his life can be compared to a wise man who built his house on an unshakable foundation. He said, when the rains fall and the flood came with the fierce winds beating upon his house, it stood firm because of its strong foundation. 
Jesus takes foundation seriously. But everyone who hears my teaching and does not apply to his life, these things can be compared to a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And when it rained and it rained, the flood came and the wind and the waves beat upon that house and it collapsed and was swept away. So my question to you this morning is what foundation are you building your life on? Would you all stand, bow your heads and close your eyes? I ask that because Jesus wants to give you a new foundation. And maybe this is the day where you go, well, David, I've been building my foundation on my finances or my education. I've been building my foundation on being a good person. And even that is great. But according to Jesus, even building your foundation by being a good person is not good enough. There is this moment when Jesus was taking the punishment of our sins on the cross. And towards the end of his life, in his moment of torture, he breathed out and he yelled out and declared, It is finished. It says in Matthew, it says, Then Jesus shouted again and he released his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split apart. The Roman officer and the old other soldiers at the crucifixion were terrified by the earthquake and all that had happened. They said, Whew, This man truly must have been the Son of God. What made them understand that? Because in this moment, not only was there a physical shaking, but there was a spiritual shaking that took place. And the foundations of religion, the foundations of sin that people were building their lives on, either on either side, were broken in two. And Jesus said, there is a new foundation I provide for you. If you want to move from sand to rock, exchange it this morning. And so here's what I would ask you to do as our prayer team comes up. If you're ready to build your life on this foundation that Jesus has given you through his blood and sacrifice and resurrection, then these amazing folks on either side of the stage, we want to pray with you so you can walk out and begin to build your life on a firm foundation. For the rest of us, Grace Point, I'm just going to ask that we open our hands. And I want us to dedicate, rededicate this work of God to him. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we dedicate Grace Point West to you. Father, I pray that you would forgive us where we have been amiss or we've made it about something other than Jesus, period. And so, Lord, what I'm asking is that you would bring unity to this house. I pray that you would bring vision to this house, united vision. I pray that you would bring understanding to this house. Lord, I pray that you would begin to whisper and bring dreams and understanding and vision. Father, as people are in your word, that it would come alive to them again, that it would not just be words on a page. Father, when they begin to declare worship to you, God, that there would be something in their hearts that come alive, Father. We say, come, Holy Spirit, and have your way. We want to see what you can do, Lord. So align us and prepare us. And so, Lord Jesus, our commitment to you is to build this church on you. Would you bless the works of our hands? Bless these families. Bless our future. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all have a wonderful week.